the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Shizlev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken, broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before God, before the God of heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for your goodness. Thank you that your graces, your mercies take shape in, in, in many different ways. Uh, sometimes in the shape of trials. Um, sometimes uh, maybe more relaxed times or easier times. But um, Lord, what you have prepared for us is great and wonderful. And the adjectives do not describe just how awesome of a plan you have for our life, and that is to shape us into your image. Lord, be with us today um, in our study. Holy Spirit, bring conviction, bring understanding, bring discernment. Lord, that the words that come from me would be forgotten and only what you have prepared for us today would remain. Help it to anchor into our, our mind and into our hearts and that it would shape us from the inside out. Not just behavioral management, but true transformation from the inside out. We love you, Lord. We worship you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Nehemiah is a book that, um, that many studies have been done on, and anything from the right kind of leadership, the certain amount of steps to the right kind of leadership. Or if you're taking on, like if you're a pastor and you want to build a new wing, uh, you know, let's, let's study from Nehemiah, study that, and, and it'll bring, you know, some understanding on the new things that we're going to take on. And uh, it's been used in many, many different ways. Some of those uh, ways are, are true. There is some truth in the type of leadership that, that Nehemiah um, displays. And he does have a plan. He has execution. He has support. He has support from the king where he is held captive. Nehemiah um, was a cupbearer. Do any of you know what the cupbearer is? It, pardon? He tasted the wine. It wasn't just, right, it wasn't just, here's your cup, O king. No, it's, you take a drink just in case it's poisoned. What a great job, right? I feel like having a steak. There you go, Nehemiah. Have a bite. He had built a, 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 a rapport with his king, with his captor, honestly. He was in exile. This is part of the Babylonian exile. The, the people of Israel had been invaded and then taken into captivity into Babylon. 
And so in captivity, the people of Israel were instructed to invest, to, to um, love that community that they were in. Yeah, this is not where you live. This is not your residence. Your residence is somewhere else, but invest here and now. Does that sound familiar? We've talked about this in the past. Where is our residence? We, we, are, we are captive here, but we are not from here. We are to invest in this community, love this community, meet the needs of this community, help each other out, love each other, be merciful. But we are not from here. A lot of the, the, the types and shadows that we see in the Old Testament point to our walk as Christians. When we see the struggle with Israel, it also illustrates our walk. In Christ, we've been adopted into his family. But this goes, this story, <clears throat> it, it's led up to from, from the beginning of time. From the fall on. Why did the pe people of Israel end up in Babylon? Babylon. Well, we go back to Adam and Eve. We see the fall. We see this walking away, stepping away from the Lord, not obeying God's commands, right? Don't eat from that fruit. They went and ate from that fruit. We see it with Cain. There was a certain amount of reverence and an orderly way of delivering your offerings to the Lord, Cain was not obedient and then became jealous because Abel did the right thing and he got praise for it. And because of the jealousy, he murdered his own brother. We see it in Noah's day. The world had become so corrupt and Noah had been preaching, taking a sip, preaching some more. And only him and his family made it to the ark. Because the world was so corrupt. And that should bring kind of a wake-up call to us nowadays because in the end times we will be like in the times of Noah. Regular life, being consumed by our life, taking into marriage, um, having kids, doing whatever we're doing, and it was... Their life in that day, their pleasures of that day, were the consumption of their time and their energy. And they could not listen or hear what Noah had to say. And so only Noah and his family were saved. And that was an opportunity. That was a new start. But the brokenness and the sin remain in the world. Even one of God's chosen, Abraham, we see him continually fail. When he was met with life or death situations, when going into a new empire, he said about his wife, tell them that you're, you're my sister. So they won't kill us both. And she is taken by the ruler of the time for some time. And that happens on a couple of different occasions. We see that with Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. Where he could have stood up 
for his great God, and instead, him and his family were corrupted by their environment. The culture influenced them. They were spared. They were able to run out of the city. But the connection for his wife and that city was so intimate that she, with care for that city and God's wrath on the city, turns back, even though the Lord's instructions were to not turn back. We see it in the people of Israel during Moses' time. They're captive in Egypt, suffering, crying out to their God for deliverance. And the Lord hears them and sends Moses. And Moses comes along with Aaron and they lead the people out. After a lot of back and forth between them and Pharaoh, they eventually leave Egypt, cross the Red Sea. They see the, these miraculous things, awesome things. The Red Sea being open, and they walk in dry land. They see these great things. And then they're fed in the desert. Daily are being fed in the desert. And they still turn from God. And they turn against Aaron. Problems would arise. Moses would step in. Take care of the problems. There would be peace for some time. And then they'd forget. And problems would arise and it'd be taken care of again. Some time would pass and they'd forget. They would speak of longing for the days in Egypt. Why don't we just go back to our captivity? Let's go back to what we know. And we had three square a day, you know, three square meals a day. And yeah, we, we worked hard, but, you know, honestly, it was probably good for our, our body to, you know, lift those brick. And look at the beautiful pyramids that we made. I don't know that they made the pyramids. That's, that can be uh, another debate. But look at the beautiful buildings that we made. And let's just go back to Egypt. Let's, let's do away with this guy. Let's do away with Moses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Lord brought him. Okay, okay. Let's get rid of him. Let's find someone else. And then he'll lead us back to Egypt. How quickly we forget. And then they wanted, they went through judges and they went through different ways of leadership and it still wasn't working out with the people. People still wanted something different than what the Lord wanted for them. And they begged and they pleaded for a king and finally they get a king. And this guy is tall and handsome and muscular and is a warrior but he was not one with God. That's Saul. He would deal with wickedness and fortune telling and spells and that sort of stuff. And then he tried to do priestly duties. That was not his job. He tried to do the work of the priest in the temple and do sacrifices. And that was not up to him to do. 
But then there is a chosen one. One man after God's own heart. Right? David. Great King David. And the lineage of Jesus. That Jesus is from the same family as David. He was a great and mighty king that loved the Lord. Adored God. But even he fell. He fell to temptation, committed adultery, had children outside of his marriage, and then had the husband killed so that he'd be out of the way and so that he wouldn't have any more remorse over what he had done. The great king David. Then we have Solomon, his son. We know Solomon. He was given the opportunity to ask for anything. And he asked for wisdom. He was a wise man. Many around him, around the world, would come and seek his counsel because he was so wise. But because he was so wise, he ended up with lots of riches, lots of livestock, animals. Animals displayed your richness. And he was one of the richest. But he allowed himself to be corrupted by foreign women. And let's, let's get it straight. It's not about ethnicity. It's not about race. It's not about different skin color. It's about who their God was. What their traditions were. But Solomon allowed himself to be corrupted by women that were not, that did not love the Lord. And so after time and time again, his people turn their backs on him and forget him. Forget the Lord. And there was division between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Two tribes in Judah, ten tribes um, up in the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom falls and eventually, hundreds of years later, the southern kingdom falls also. And they are invaded. And this is what brings them to Babylon. We see time and time again throughout the Bible that the Lord uses ordinary people, broken people, People like us. Are you perfect? I know that I'm not. I'll confess to you right now that I'm not. But if there's repentance and right relationship with the Lord, there can be so many things that we can accomplish through God's direction and His strength, His discernment. We can impact this world for the kingdom of God. It takes ordinary people. But it takes people. We are the hands and feet of Jesus here on earth. He accomplishes his work here and now through us. Nehemiah displays when we get into it, we'll see certain families did certain things. They were in charge of a certain part of the wall. And they're named off. And we, 
they are some weird names, so when we get through it, please uh, show some grace, because I'll probably fumble through some of them. It's not like Joe and, and Bill and Bob and whatever. You know, it, there's some like ten syllable names in there that. But the fact that that's recorded, right? These people took on that part of the wall, and these people took on that part of the wall, and these people did the gate. It takes people. We're, um, we're at a certain point in our life as a church where I said two or three weeks ago, there needs to be some sober thinking as we look at our future. What kind of legacy are we going to have? What kind of results do we want to have? The Lord is at work. God is at work in this community. And there are people that he is working on their hearts and mind and he is priming them so that we can go to them and have a word with them about our Lord. Certain people will not receive. They will not open the door to you. They will not want to speak of Jesus Christ. But there are others that will. And he is preparing the ground already. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I remember as a kid, and I, I was one of those that wanted to be one of the few. We did, you know, uh, we'd go to Valde or the surrounding areas and... and uh, pick onions or, you know, whatever was, you know, the crop at the time. Four in the morning, early, vamonos. And if it wasn't in this area, then we go up to North Texas or go outside of the state. Whatever the crop was at the time, we were going. It's hard work being in the field. You get tired, you get exhausted, the sun beats on you. You get hungry, so you go and eat everybody else's tacos. You deal with snakes. You deal with all kinds of stuff. Ants. And we're a part of the work that the Lord is doing. There's going to be, we're going to empty ourselves to pour into others so we'll be hungry. We might come face to face with the enemy. So it takes preparedness, it takes prayer, it takes fasting, it takes God's word to prepare our hearts and our minds so that we know that we have a God that we can depend on. And this is our reminder. I point, I point to the computer all the time, but the Word of God is our reminder that we have a God that we can depend on. More powerful than the enemy. Far more powerful. He is a created being by God. The, end, the, the world wants to paint this picture that they do a battle, right? That there's always this battle between good and evil. Now, we can't take them on. Don't try to take on the enemy all by yourself. You know, you muster up some strength and I'm, I'm going to get you. No, you will fail. But the power of God 
He's already won. Victory is ours. We're taking care of the details. He's already won. It takes prayer. It takes fasting. Preparedness in the word of God. Nehemiah says in verse 4, that when he heard these things, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. He was moved to tears because of his passion for his city. He was mourning and grieving over his city. That it was torn down and the wall, there was no defenses So he grieved over his city. Do you grieve over your city? Does it move you to tears? You can go to the gas station and ask anybody if they believe in God, and they do. They'll say, yeah, I believe in God. And they have a false security because Jesus Christ has not come into them and transformed them. It's just a superficial thing. And so it's up to us to stand for truth, to teach truth, to disciple, go on to all the nations and make disciples Disciples, instruct them. When, when the people of Israel were um, right there at the edge of the promised land, they sent in some spies to take a look at the land, to see what they saw. Was it 12 people that were sent in? 10 of them were like, no way. We're not going in there. There's giants in there. There's humongous ants like, that'll eat you up. Sorry, I added that in. There wasn't any ants. But there was big creatures, big people. Yeah, there was some big fruit, but man, how are we going to overcome you know, the, the ones that are there now? Two guys were like, we can take them. We can do this thing. Because they knew their God. There's obstacles. But don't be overwhelmed by the obstacles. Let the promises of God overwhelm you. He has the victory. Let's pray. After the prayer, I just want to say one more thing and we'll get to it there. Lord, we thank you this morning, God, for your word. We thank you for, um, for the opportunity that you give us, Lord, to serve. We are bond servants. We are willing slaves to your cause. Like Paul says, we surrender to you. We depend upon you. We're humbled that we get the opportunity to represent you. Lord, where we fail, we ask your forgiveness. Give us clarity so that we may continue to grow in our blind spots when we can't see where it is that we fail. Lord, bring correction in a loving way through our brothers and sisters. Help us to interact with each other in a way that builds up, that we are shaped more into your image. 
so that when the people that are lost see us, they are moved by the love of Christ among us. Your good God, we thank you for your goodness, Lord. We love you. We worship you, God. In your name we pray. Amen.